I hope not everybody is full because we're going to be sleepy. All that oxygen that's supposed to go in our mind is going to get diverted to our stomach. And oh, we're going to feel really, really drowsy. So, but uh, other than that, uh, I know we'll have a good uh, spiritual food that we will receive tonight on top of that physical food that we already ate downstairs. But anyway, welcome once again on our, what installment it is? Five. Tonight is number five, okay? Tonight is number five. So what's the first one? What's the, what's the, what's the first one? Growing in his word. The second one is growing in his grace. The third one is growing in his service. And then the fourth one is, well, state of the dead, right? The state of the dead. That was Sunday night. So this will be our fifth uh, installment, our, our, and this would be the second week. And just to remind everybody, uh, tomorrow for our divine service would be number six, and then we will have another uh, service Saturday night, and then the following would be Sunday night. And after Sunday night, we won't be meeting again until Wednesday. So Wednesday... Friday, which will culminate on our church anniversary, which is Saturday next week. All right? But I'm pretty sure all of us so far have been blessed by the messages that we have received, right? Now, if we, if we come to think of it, if we come to think of it, a major theme that we can see is that all of us, all of us here, all of us Christians, all of us say, Seventh-day Adventists, all of us humans, it's really for us to be knocked out, or it's really for us, really easy for us to uh, deviate. When we feel that we're so good in our faith, we become complacent. We become complacent with our beliefs, with our faith. And this, the good thing about this revival series that we have is it, it kind of gauges us. It kind of gauges us once again where we need to be at. It, it reminds us to put us back into perspective. And God uses these things so that we go back into rhythm. We go back into the original plan of God, right? This revival series. It kinda, it's, it's a good review. This is something that we probably, that we know it's in the back burner of our brain, but it's good to kind of dig it from the back of, back side of our minds and then put it on the front, right? And then I have an acronym for all of us here as we continue with, with the series that we will have. The acronym is ACT. ACT. The first one is ask God. Ask. Ask God what areas in your life I need to improve upon. Ask areas where I need discipline. Ask areas of to show to show us that God to lead you back areas that you are lost to give you discernment ask God for help to control our impulses right so a is for ask c is challenge challenge yourself create a plan okay and if we need help sticking to the plan what do we do we pray about it we ask God for help and then t is to talk about it. Tell it. Tell it. Share to others what your experience is. Be open about it and talk to God more about it. So that's my short acronym, ACT. Now, again, once uh, I want to welcome everyone. We have Bibles at the end of the pews if you want to use it for uh, reading. Uh, but just remember to put it back there, and then we will continue to use it for the rest of the series, which we will be giving away at the end of our revival series. Um, I w and to continue, I would like to everybody to please bow down your heads for a prayer. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you tonight for giving us this time, this opportunity to be here in this holy place. 
to worship you and then you to study your word. We want to thank you, Lord, for your guidance and protection throughout the week. We thank you, Lord, for another Sabbath that you've given us to be restored, to heal, to recover, and to commune with our brothers and sisters. And Lord, we invite your presence to be with us. May you open our hearts and minds as we receive the holy message that you wanted us to receive. May you protect us throughout our service. And may everything that we will do and say will be for the glory of your name. Forgive us, Lord, from our sins. And we ask for the Holy Spirit's presence to be in our midst. Thank you, Lord, for answering our prayers. Thank you for the blessings. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. one more time.
So our next song is Jesus We Love You. And um, the reason we chose this song was because last week Pastor Liwanek had shared the verse, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14 to 24, or chapter 5, verse 17, which reads, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So please join us as we sing How Much We Love Jesus. Things have passed away. Your love has stayed the same. Your constant grace remains the cornerstone. Things that we thought were dead are breathing.
The cry of my heart is to love you more, to live with the touch of your hand, stronger each day. Show me your ways, stronger each day. Show be seated. For our garden of prayer, for those who are able and who wish to, you may come to the front. The rest, it's all meal for those who are able. Father God, we rejoice to be in your presence at the early hours of your Sabbath. In Ezekiel 37, 27, it says that your dwelling place is among men. You will be our God and we are going to be your people. What a privilege indeed it is to be called your sons and your daughters. Like the Apostle Paul in Romans seven nineteen, we lament that the good that we want to do, we don't do. We don't want to do what is wrong, but that is what we do. Please, Father God, forgive our wrong wrongdoings. We claim 2 Corinthians 12, 9. Your grace is sufficient for us. Your power 
is made perfect in weakness. And it goes on to say that we would welcome anything that would challenge us, that would, uh, that would weaken us, because when we are weak, then we are strong in you. Tonight, Father God, some of us have come with praises and rejoicing. Some have come with hearts heavy with burden. At this time, Father, please hear our silent praise and our petitions. We lift to you tonight our pastor, Pastor Lim. You have given him your message. We ask that you anoint his lips so that your words be our guide and inspiration to remain faithful in following you until you come again. On bended knees, we hear these words. Sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer. Thy wings shall my petition bear to him whose truth and faithfulness engage the waiting soul to bless. Amen. Happy Sabbath, church. Are you happy to be in the house of the Lord tonight? Amen, amen, amen. So, I'm glad to be here. I'm so excited to see you all. And we are on our fifth series for our Growing in Christ. How many of you find gardening or growing plants uh, amusing? And also, maybe I would just like to do that. Yeah? We have uh, a lot of gardeners here in our congregation. Oh. There you go. There you go. Yes, yes. Um, so we have um, a lot of gardeners in our congregation, in our church family. And uh, in fact, I'm a beneficiary of... Um, so many of uh, the, the produce from your backyard. You know, you, you have several uh, fruit trees and uh, whatnot. And over the years, we have just been receiving the blessing from above through the harvest in your backyard. I remember Manang Mirna and... Uh, uh, Ate Florian Cuyajeri and Ate Merlinda. And I began to, I, I begin to uh, mention names and maybe I will forget some. And Kuya Ben, when, when uh, he has some green leaves that I, one of my favorite Ampalaya leaves, so, uh, it's a treat because I don't have those. Eh? And uh, you know, you harvest because you planted. And between the planting and the emerging of the shoots, maybe one or two, and the harvesting time, a lot of things happen there, right? It's not easy. You're going to, you're going to allow time, its natural course to happen in order for you to harvest from your produce. It is true that they say great endings find their genesis in small beginnings. If we are not going to plant something, well then we are not going to expect to harvest anything. It's just the natural course. It's just the natural 
consequence of things. But maybe, you know, um, I, I, I believe that plants, the, the growth of plants is a miracle. But maybe the biggest miracle that we and you and I can agree is when, is when a baby is born. When a baby is born. Dads, how many of you have been in the room where a baby was born? Dads, dads. All right, okay. Well, good for you, good for you. You know that hand there? Whose hand is that? <laughs> That's my hand. That's my hand. And do you know whose baby is this? <laughs> oh, yeah, you guess it right. Andrea. She is the only one that I get the privilege to be in the room where, where Kim was giving birth. Back in the Philippines, of course, uh, um, Kim and Bea, um, they were born in the Philippines. And in both cases, I was not in the hospital. <laughs> I wasn't in the hospital. But over here, you know, at Paradise Valley Hospital, um, of course, during that time, they allowed dads. And I was checking uh, with Kim at uh, Sharp Chula Vista, and they say, well, you know, even, even uh, the, the parents are allowed to be there. Maybe whoever can fit in the delivery room, they're going to allow you to be there to witness. My, my, you know, that's, that's an awesome memory-making experience for me. I saw my youngest daughter came out alive. That's a miracle after she was given a bath. Now, how many fundamental beliefs do we have? 28. Have you known that we have a fundamental belief for so, uh, so long a time already? Or just very recently? You know, um, back in 2003, our theologians and pastors, those who were confronting questions about the power of the evil spirit outside of North America, they have been confronted with this, with this situation. And uh, um, Elder Ryan, um, who became a uh, the director of mission, global mission, in 2005, was sharing his testimony that he has been in congregations where the people's question is that, so pastor, what are you going to do to liberate us from the evil spirits? Certainly there is power In this world, outside of the, the power of God, the power of the enemy, and we are, we are aware of this. And as a result of this study of the word of God, there was a sense that either they are going to put, you know, this, this, uh, or inject to what is already an existing belief, in the 27 fundamental beliefs about addressing this issue of the evil spirits and how to counter them, or maybe it's, it's better to make a, 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 um, another set of beliefs. And that was what happened. 2020, uh, 2005, those of you who attended the general conference in uh, St. Louis, Missouri, you know, we drove up there. That, that was our first general conference um, session attendance or experience in uh, St. Louis, Missouri. 2005, it was voted this um, fundamental beliefs about growth in Christ. If you are not already familiar, this is what it says. Fundamental beliefs number 11. By his cross, Jesus triumphed over the forces of evil. He who subjugated the demonic spirits during his earthly ministry 
has broken their power and made certain their ultimate doom. It goes on to say, Jesus, Jesus' victory gives us victory over the evil forces that still seek to control us. As we walk with him in peace, joy, and assurance of his love, it says, now the Holy Spirit dwells within us and empowers us. Continually committed to Jesus as our Savior and Lord, we are set free from the burden of our past deeds. No longer do we live in the darkness, fear of evil powers, ignorance, and meaninglessness of our former way of life. And then he says, in this new freedom in Jesus, we are called to grow into the likeness of his character. And then I highlighted those Five things. It says, and it's very difficult to read from here. It says, communing with him daily in prayer, feeding on his word, that's second, meditating on it and on his providence, singing his praises, gathering together for worship, and that is fellowship. And participating in the mission of the church. Now I know that you, are, you and I are familiar with almost all of this, all of these practices or discipline. And it's saying that this fundamental belief is saying that in order for us to acquire and to have the power of the Holy Spirit, we need to live not short of these practices. Are you following? We have to include that in our journey as a Christian. It didn't end here. It says further, as we give ourselves in loving service to those around us, it says, and in witnessing to his salvation, his constant presence with us through the spirit sanctifies every moment and notice this, notice this every task in into a spiritual experience now as we continue to follow and to pursue this journey or practice then you, did you uh, did you um, notice that the holy spirit is to take to take that, that action, that decision, that choice, and it's, it's going to grow in us the power that only comes from him. It's not something that innate or inherently in us. It is something that is being given by the Holy Spirit, but we have to continue to live in these practices. Does that make sense? For if I, for instance, will, will, will um, fail to commune, if I fail to commune with God daily in prayer, and that's a very important piece of our practice, prayer. And we know that prayer, according to Ellen White, is, is talking to God as to a friend. And it has been, it has been um, emphasized during this series that when you pray, you know, you don't need to use some highfalutin words, so to speak. You just have to say what is in your heart. And if I fail to feed from the word of God, the Bible, then how am I supposed to stand against the wiles of the evil one? And it goes on and on to these practices. We're talking about growing in Christ. Growing in Christ. Now, this growing in Christ is also talking about 
process of growth. I think it's, it boils, boils down to now, how am I going to live that way? If this is not a challenge to Christians, then our witness is going to be efficient. And then when our witness is going to be efficient, it will be followed by fruitfulness. Are you following? Does that make sense? Now, if we take the equation reversely, if I do not have fruit, what does it mean? I don't have a relationship with the Lord. I'm not growing. And if I'm not growing, then I lack the practices that will allow me to grow and mature in my Christian journey. Are you following church family? Okay. Now, process of growth. Practice. Your routine. And some says rhythm of life. Or I just simply call it devotional pattern. Well, many of us has a very meaningful devotional pattern. And that is very, very important. A Christian... A Christian that does not have a devotional time is really not going to grow maturely in his spiritual life. That's a very bold claim. But that is just the reality of it. That is just the reality. Now, look with me here. Seth Pierce, he is the, um, the author of the, the What We Believe uh, edition, teens edition, teens edition. And sometimes, you know, if you if you explore the the books for the kids, the uh, <laughs> the method of explanation is easier to understand. <laughs> and he said, anyways, he said, perhaps the most important part of a Christian's life, besides. He said, believing in Jesus is devotional time with God. A devotional life simply means the part of your day that you devote to God. I agree with him. I don't know with you. Outside of accepting the Lord Jesus Christ, what nurtures your journey and my journey happens in this process we call devotional time. There is no growth outside or in the absence of devotional life. Ded time dedicated to just knowing the Lord in a very intimate and personal way. Now, um, this this uh, Tension. Actually, there is a tension. There is a tension between what we want to do and what we do. And, 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 and tension uh, to the point where it becomes so natural for any individual to just neglect connecting with the Lord. Does that make sense? Natural. You, we don't need actually to, um, to, ref, to, to, to make great effort not to connect with the Lord. That's our, that's our default mode. Our default mode is sever or disconnect or unplug our lives in connection to God and to the Lord Jesus Christ. And Blaise Pascal has captured this tension, this problem in humanity. When he asked this question, if man is not made for God, why is he only happy in God? Is the question, does the, does the question make sense to you? If man is not made for God, why is he happy only in God? 
And you heard testimonies after testimonies of people who have explored everything that this world offers. And then they come to a point where they say, oh, I did not find satisfaction in these things. I was able to go almost the whole world and enjoy whatever this world offers, and yet there is not any satisfaction. There is not any fulfillment. And there is something that is unquenched, unquenchably not being fulfilled inside of me. Well, the Bible has an example of that. King Solomon, the wisest king who ever lived on earth. And um, his fame is all over the world. Writing the book of Ecclesiastes, you find that with all the blessings that he, he experienced from God, he could still say, vanity, vanity. All is vanity. Another word is meaningless. Meaningless. Everything is meaningless, he says. But this is King Solomon who acquired almost everything there is in this world or this world offers. And yet he still finds himself wanting, meaningless, meaningless. He cried. But this is just one part of the question of Blaise Pascal. Yes, he says, if man is not made for God, why is he only happy in God? The second one is really kind of like pointing us to our natural, natural dislike to talk to God. And why is that? We have a natural dislike to connect with God. And we, it's easy for us to do so many things for God in order to avoid the face of God. I can tell myself to do ministry but not have an intimate and meaningful relationship with the Lord Jesus. And Blaise Pascal says, if man is made for God. Why is he so opposed to God? Why is he so opposed to God? The Bible is clear. Isaiah says, your iniquities have separated you from your, your God and your sins and my sins have hidden God's face from us. That's the, the reason why. Naturally, we have, we, we do not need to be energized to sever our relationship with God. And again, our default mode is to run away from God. I was looking into this subject matter, and of course, um, have personally discovered from the word of God that all is not lost. In the pages of the Bible, we find the, I would say, insatiable quench of God to establish a relationship with us. I say that because he is very intentional. God desires to connect with us. God expects that we allot time for him. And why is that? Well, it's because this idea of what I call relational covenant. What is a relational covenant? God covenanted himself from the very, very beginning that he's going to establish a relationship with us. Let me show that very quickly to you. Let's, let's um, open your Bible. 
Let's open our Bible. Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6, 17 and 18. Genesis 6, 17 and 18. And this is what we find. Genesis 6, 17 and 18. And behold, I myself, God speaking, and behold, I myself am bringing flood waters on the earth to destroy from under heaven all flesh in which is the breath of life. Everything that is on the earth shall die. 18. But I will establish my what? Covenant with you, and you shall go into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. Maybe the first time the word covenant was mentioned in the Bible. This is, you know, a covenant is, is just a promise. Simply, it, it means a promise. But today, in our modern time, you enter a covenant with another party. You do not have a covenant by <laughs> if, if there's just, just one party. And in the covenant, both parties need to agree what they are going to covenant with. In case of God, in case of God, this is a unilateral covenant. He did not seek, he did not ask for the opinion of mankind, he just pronounced that this is what I'm going to do, God says. I'm going to have a covenant with you. But what is God's covenant? What is God's promise to us? What is God's promise at least for Noah during that time? And that carries on to our generation today. What is God's promise? And this is a beautiful promise. Genesis 17, 7. Uh, Genesis 17, 7. This is the promise of God. And I'm praying. And I'm, I'm uh, desiring that when we see this intentional act of God to have a relationship with us, then we're not going to be afraid anymore. Then we are going to be encouraged that that is anyway God's, God's uh, desire for us to have that time with him. And he says, um, 17, Genesis 17, verse 7, New King James Version, it says, and I will establish my covenant between me and you. Again, this is a unilateral covenant and your descendants after you in their generations. What is the content of that covenant? What is God promising? He says, for an everlasting covenant. And this is what he is promising. And I don't know if you would not like this. He says, to be God to you and your descendants after you. God says, my promise to you is I'm going to be your God. And this theme runs into all the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation. What is this uh, promise? God says that I will be your God and you shall be my people. Amen? Amen. Wow. We, don't, we didn't even want to be in that kind of contract with God. He designed that unilaterally and yet at the very, very foundation of that contract, of that covenant, God's desire is to be with you and to be with me. Yes, that is God's desire. And you find that those are just some of the passages that speaks about this covenant. God says, I will be your God and you shall be my people. Now, how many have seen God face to face? How many have seen God face to face that you, you remember? Not a lot, huh? Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve. Abraham. But even, even Adam and Eve, 
the narrative that we find, actually the narrative that we find are, are implications that there is or there was a face-to-face -face conversation between God and Adam and Eve. And we do not find in, in the book of Genesis an exact verse that says, you know, they are talking face to face, except, you know, three places. What I remember on top of my head is then when, when, when God married them, that's one. But that is just the, the relating of the event. God married them, and you would, you would expect that it was a face to face, right? If God, God officiated the marriage, it's not going to be online, <laughs> right? It should be face to face. And also another one is when, another one is when God uh, instructed them about the, the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. It must be face to face. But then after that, one incident or, or, or narrative in, the, in Genesis that may be very close to the fact that God was talking close to Adam and Eve is when they fall into sin. And that God, you know, was calling for Adam and Eve, where are you, where are you? But they hid themselves, right? That is also an insinuation that maybe uh, they were in close proximity to each other and yet not face to face because they were hiding. Adam and Eve, right? They were hiding. Now, this is the, the, the reality. Since God made a promise to man to be their God, it is his moral obligation. Those are my words. And you can, <laughs> you, you can, uh, you know, um, uh, if that is a mistake, then that's my fault. But that is how I, <laughs> how, how I, I, uh, I sense this. Since God made a promise to man to be their God, it is his moral obligation to reveal himself to man, for without him revealing himself, man cannot comprehend his ways, much more establish a relationship with him. Now put this together. Put this together with, with me. God made a covenant and he says, I will be your God and you shall be my people. But God is holy and after the fall of Adam and Eve, man is sinful. And there was a gap between God and man. Sin is in between. And as a result of that, we do not want to, we do not want to do anything with God, but God keeps on wooing us. And because he has this covenant, it is his, it is, it is his obligation to reveal himself. For how are we going to find God if he, he, he's not going to reveal himself to us? Does that make sense? Therefore, this is the point. God wants to establish a relationship with us and his instrument of doing that is communion. Communion is God's initiative of reaching down to us because of his covenant, because of his promise. He has to reveal himself. So what does that mean? What does that mean? It means this relational covenant, that's very small. It means that because of this promise or covenant, God bound himself to meet with you and me whenever you reach out to him. That's the implication. Because God made that promise, he is bound to have that um, availability to meet with us. And also, he makes this a reality through communion, as I said. And every time, and I like this part, every time you choose to connect with that God, and this is my favorite part. This is my favorite part. If you intend to spend time with God, it's going to show up. How about that? 
if you want to, to, to be with God, he's going to meet with you. He cannot do, you know, he, he cannot detract from that. He's going to meet with you. And I think and I believe that this is a very positive thing to understand. If we are struggling to connect with God, we know that he wants to meet with us. And so we don't need to make an appointment. We don't need to uh, go through um, so many rituals in order to see the face of God. What is our part? What is our part? Our part, our part is devotional patterns. Communion is God's initiative of reaching to us and our initiative to reach out to God is through devotional patterns. Are this thinking? Does this make sense? Devotional patterns are ways that we practice in order for us to connect with God. We already know that God wants to connect with us. Then we need to make ourselves available we need to make time in order to meet with him. And how do we do this? Well, the most common practice that everybody understands meeting with God is reading his word, which is correct. But that, that's, that's not going to limit our uh, appointment or um, making an intentional time with God. Um, I find the example of uh, David in his life. In all the contours of his life, his successes and his failures. His practice gives us a very positive uh, example that we can emulate. That we can emulate. David was a model on pursuing a devotional practice. Pattern of devotion of David. And um, I believe all of this, one way or the other, many of us are practicing. I'm not going to dwell, uh, you know, extensively or comprehensively on each of this. But I just want to show that in these practices, we find David's desire of connecting with God. And so, what my desire is for us to also accept and understand and realize that when we say Devotional pattern, it includes, and it is not limited to reading the word of God. That's part of it. But in it, it includes all of these practices. These practices entirely constitute for David a devotional pattern or his initiative to connect with God. Prayer. 50 actual prayers of David in the book of Psalms. And there are prayers attributed to David outside of Psalms, like in uh, 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel. So you can just imagine that David's life was really bathed in prayer. David knows how to pray. And if I have a devotional pattern, I need to pray. I need to pray. Also, meditation. Eight words in the, the book of Psalms that you can find that the word meditation was mentioned. And then out of eight, five of those David used. Which means to say that David, one of David's practice is meditation. I know, I know. There's, there's some, some sections, even in our Adventist circles, 
that are a little bit worried about the word meditation. But that's, that's a biblical word, and you find that also in the spirit of prophecy. But all this is saying, it, it, it's different. The meditation meaning is not the Eastern way of meditation, where you engage in chanting, and where you have the ability, according to this practice, to kind of like lift or um, dissociate yourself from your, from, your, from your physical body. That's not what we're talking here. Meditation here is that you, you kind of like roll, so to speak, the words or the passages that you're studying, you kind of like roll it over and over in your mind. And, and, and that's getting your attention. And, and you're trying to understand what that means. And you think about it. You think about it. And because of that, you are able to understand. And maybe just like David, just like in one of David's experience, he was able to prevent, to commit a sin or mistake in his life. Like for instance, uh, you remember the story of, uh, of uh, Saul when he was living himself in a cave. And it so happened that David and his men were there, right? And over there, uh, uh, King Saul kind of like rested and slept. And, and the soldiers of David says, hey, this is your time. God gave you the king. Go ahead and, and kill him. And, and anyways, David was anointed king of Israel already. But here is the, here is the passage. And I want to bring you your, your attention there very quickly. And, and the rest are not so, so, so long anyways. But let me just bring your attention to, to uh, establish this point. Meditation. First Samuel 24. 1 Samuel 24, verse 5. Let's go there very quickly. 1 Samuel 24, verse 5. First Samuel 24, verse Verse 5, and it reads, 1 Samuel 24, 5. Now it happened afterward that David's heart troubled him because he had cut Saul's robe. Of course, it's, instead of killing him, he uh, got, uh, um, what shall I call this one? This is, this is kind of like a, a token. It was a token that he was so close he could kill the king, and yet he didn't. And because of this action, when it says that, that David troubled, or his heart was troubled, the word in the original um, was actually, can be translated in English as meditate. He meditated on his action, and as a result, as a result of that, he did not end up Killing the king. He spared himself from such a horrible mistake. Not only meditation, David knew how to worship. He knew how to worship. In, in 2 Samuel 7, 19 to 21, or let me just go to 2 Samuel 7, 22. 2 Samuel 7, 22. These words and expressions of David just reflects his, his heart's desire and intention about God. He said, therefore, you are great, O Lord God, for there is none like you, nor is there any God besides you, according to all that we have heard with our ears. And you can connect here uh, Psalm, 20, Psalm uh, chapter 8, where in verses 1 to 3, David says, O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth, who have set your glory above the heavens. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him, 
and the Son of Man that you visit him, for you have made him a little lower than the angels, and you have crowned him with glory and honor. Maybe one of the practice that is very, very um, uh, identifiable, it, it's identifiable with David, is his act of confession. As we all know, David made horrible mistakes in his life. To commit a mistake is one, one thing, and to recognize and confess about that sin is another thing. And David did not have problem of confession. It may not come easy to him, but he did made a confession. Um, Psalm 32, 3 to 5 is an example of this. The, the, the struggle that David was having in his mind, we find that in Psalm 32, 3 to 5, where, where it says, when I kept silent, David was writing, my bones grew old through my groaning all the day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into a drought of summer. And here, he says, I acknowledged my sin to you, and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. What a gesture. It's difficult to do it, and yet, we need to have this as part of our devotional practice, confession, and then repentance. Repentance, oh, who would not forget David's maybe greatest sin of all the sins, the major sin, you can say, of David in his entire life. And it was recorded not only the narrative of that sin, but pointing to that sin, his sin against uh, Uriah and Bathsheba. First Kings chapter 15, verse five, has this, has this chronicle about that sin of David. First Kings 15, verse five, and it says, David did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and had not turned aside from anything that he commanded him all the days of his life. That's a very good resume, right? All the days of his life. But these few words that's going to follow after that, it says, except in the matter of Uriah the Hittite. He murdered Uriah and took his wife. Scriptures, oh David, you know, um, lift the word of God in his life. And a very good example is Psalm 19, seven to eight, where he says, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgment of the Lord, the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yeah, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. You know, um, when Dwight L. Moody, that great American preacher was on his deathbed. He didn't want to, um, he didn't want to entertain any guests anymore. He had a friend when he was still strong by the name of Will Thompson. And Will Thompson wrote a hymn, a poem, which became a hymn and became one of uh, the most popular composition he ever made. And this is entitled, 
softly and tenderly. And um, the song is just um, brief and it's not long. The song, and maybe you're familiar with this hymn, it says, softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. See on the portals, he's waiting and watching, watching for you and for me. Come home, come home. Ye who are weary, come home. Earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling, O sinner, come home. And then the second stanza says, O oh, for the wonderful love he has promised, promised for you and for me. Though we have sinned, he has mercy and pardon, pardon for you and for me. I know that all of us has been in some spaces, in some, in some places of our journey that it's really making us difficult to come back to God. We are talking here of like going to church. If going to church and attending the gathering is not at all that difficult. And yet the more difficult is to admit and to see ourselves where we are in the sight of God. We can be close and yet far from Him. And maybe, maybe just like myself, you are thinking, oh, so, okay, so God, what am I going to do? And tonight, we know that it is God's desire for you and for me to grow in our spiritual walk with Him. And in order to emphasize this, from the very beginning of the scriptures, he already laid out the foundation through his relational covenant. He's saying, you are my people. Hey, I am your God. And I'm here. I'm going to reveal myself. If you come to me, I'm going to be there. There is no call for God that he is not going to show up. What am I going to do? What I'm going to do is to call upon him and to make time for him. And in the life of David, we find these practices where we can really create a space to be with God. Prayer, meditation, worship, confession, repentance, and scripture. Now, now, tonight, if you sense that God wants you to acknowledge his invitation to make intentional, meaningful, and consistent time with him throughout devotional pattern, wherever you are, you may be starting you may have a great one and you may be struggling wherever you are in that spectrum and yet you saw tonight that that is what you want to pursue. I invite you to stand. I invite you to stand and to say to yourself, Lord God, I don't know what to do, but I know when I come, when I, 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 I make a, an intentional time with you, you are going to show up. You are going to be there for me. Is that your, is that your desire? I invite you to stand. And we are going to have a prayer. Father God, Jesus, O oh Holy Spirit, thank you for this time that you have showed to us tonight that more than our desire, you have greater desire to meet with us. You are already there in the spaces and places where we intend to meet you. It's up to us to show up because you will always show up 
and be there for us. With our meager efforts and our inconsistency, thank you for calling us and for reminding us that we can energize and we can be intentional in our connection with you. In this process, O oh Lord, as we pursue growing in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, help us, O oh Holy Spirit. Strengthen and encourage us. Accept this commitment of your people now. I ask in the powerful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And everybody said, Amen, amen and amen. You may be seated.
What a powerful message we got tonight, right? Such a wonderful word, such a powerful message in which we all understand that we, as Seventh-day Adventists, as Christians, we have a living God. A living God that is willing, is always there to redeem us. No matter how many times we have sinned, and no matter how powerful the evil forces are of this world, God will save us. God will forgive us. God will redeem us. And all we have to do is to ask for it, to pray for it, to confess for it, and He will gladly take us back. So once again, brothers and sisters, we will see you tomorrow. Our next uh, part of our series is going to be during our divine service. So all of you, I expect everybody to be back and also for our uh, for all our brethren who, was, who are joining us via our online platforms, we will see you again. Have a good night, happy Sabbath, and God bless us all. Choir members, please um, work your way downstairs to the uh, youth room. We'll see you there. Hello? 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 Hello, hello, hello.